Greetings and salutations, friends. So, finally, we are moving on to the Tomb Kings of Kemri, which is one of my favorite factions because they take the uh, more or less tired old trope of the undead horde and put a bit of a fresh spin on it with a bit of an Egyptian theme. And they have a rather unique play style within Warhammer World, with their armies often relying on chariots instead of good old-fashioned cavalry. And having some interesting units along the lines of their archers, who are pretty damn good in melee, to be honest, not fantastic, big skeletons and all, but they can also fire while moving, and they don't really take any accuracy penalties to doing so. And they also have a ton of kick-ass monsters at their disposal. And it really is a combination of these factors that make the Tomb King so interesting on the tabletop and potentially so goddamn interesting in a total war game. It is an undead army, yes, but it focuses so much more on maneuverability and hitting power than the undead army of the Vampire Count. The Tomb Kings of Kemri are fast, surprisingly fast, surprisingly good at shooting, and surprisingly fighty to the point where many of the monsters are the equal even of a great demons and that kind of stuff, and many of the units, like the chariots, while they do require some babysitting since they can't really change direction all that fast, they are remarkably hard-hitting units. And of course, the statuettes that make up the monster sections are proper, proper nasty little bastards. And even the basic skeletons are not terrible fighters, particularly not the Tomb Guard. Shove a properly kitted up Tomb King in the front rank of a bunch of Tomb Guards and you've got yourself a pretty damn feisty combat unit. But, of course, the army itself is not everything about the Tomb Kings. They have a fair bit of origin story lore that's been fleshed out via the End Times books. So, before I even begin on that, let me just note that a lot of this lore has gotten a little bit contradictory as of late due to the End Times books. A lot of what was written in the End Times kind of clash with the older books, and a lot of the older books really, really clash with the End Times. So, uh, I will just be doing my preferred uh, version of all of this, and I'll be giving you a little bit of general information about both of the versions, but in general, I'll try to pick whichever version is the most logical, so to say, and the most up-to-date, as is what I do with pretty much all of my videos. So, I uh, hope you'll be enjoying this uh, little lore video, so um, let's get started, shall we? But to understand what the Tomb Kings are today, you have to understand from whence they came. As originally they were a human kingdom, or more correctly, a collection of human kingdoms. Sometimes after the War of Vengeance, or War of the Beards, depending on who you ask, but sometimes before the Great Catastrophe that rocked the World Edge Mountains and way before the coming of Sigma, Various nomadic desert-dwelling tribes scattered across the great desert to the south of the Old World did what pretty much all civilizations have throughout history. They settled down and they began building cities, founding the Eight Kingdoms of Nehechara. These kingdoms were Khemri, Zandri, Numas, Qatar, Razetra, Maharak, Libaras, and Lachimia. And these kingdoms waged a nearly endless war between each other, grabbing a little bit of territory here, an oasis there, a bit of fertile land there. But any time a single kingdom seemed to be gaining too much power, two or more of the other kingdoms would uh, join in power to take the upstart down a peg. And so, the kingdoms remained locked in intermittent warfare until the rise of Setra, who was to become the greatest of the Tomb Kings. Leading the armies of Khemri IV, Setra conquered all of the various other city-states and unified them all into the Empire of Khemri, and as such, you could call the Land of the Dead both Nehekara and Khemri, both are technically correct, although Nehekara is probably the more accurate, although I will mostly be using Kemri because it's a hell of a lot easier to say, so that'll be a little bit of a sacrifice on the altar of pragmatism right there. Besides, if I say Nehekara one more time, I fear that my Adam's apple is going to jump out of my mouth. 
and so began a period of prosperity for Kemri under the rule of Setra. However, Setra was just a man, and as all men, he must at one point die. But the great king Setra did not see this as entirely fair, and continuously sought ways of extending his mortal life. And while the mortuary cult of Kemri had uh, always been in a position of some significant political power and influence within the kingdoms, Setra essentially gave them carte blanche to do whatever they could to find a way to let him live on forever. But before I go on, I probably have to explain to you exactly what the mortuary cult was. And to do that, I will bring up an example from our own history. The ancient kingdom of Egypt from our own time, upon which the Tomb Kings are loosely based, and I say loosely because yes, they have some similarities, but you know, one of them is undead and one of them is, well, not. One of them has magic and the other, well, has not and all of those things, so loosely based. Anyways, back to the point, shall we, before I wander completely off the mark. In Egypt, they had a long-standing tradition, or more like really a rule, that any ruler, or pharaoh to be more correct, and some members of his household upon death were mummified. And this process of mummification was known as embalming. And this process involved uh, various rather grisly rituals that, amongst other things, included the removal of various internal organs from the nose and the arse, because why not? And rubbing down the fresh corpse, or hopefully fresh corpse anyway, it was a particularly severe sentence to be embalmed alive, although not properly embalmed. Essentially, they just used it as a form of torture because, well, the ancient Egyptians were kind of assholes that way. But it was usually meant as a bit of an honour. It was to secure your passage into the afterlife and make sure that you could pass into the afterlife with your body intact. As once the body was fully mummified, it didn't rot to nearly the same extent that a normal, unembalmed dead corpse would. To the extent where we have fairly well-preserved mummified remains even to this day. And the process of mummification was much the same in the Kingdom of Khemri. However, with King Setra's quest for immortality, the mortuary cult began various experiments to try and get this to actually happen, and although upon King Setra's death they had indeed not succeeded in creating a cure for death, so to say, they promised him and all of the other kings that were embalmed from that point on that they would be awakened from their deathly slumber into an earthly paradise of prosperity and beauty. Just as soon as the mortuary cult could figure out just how they were going to do that. And so, after the death of the king Setra, the kingdom of Khemri had three further dynasties, the first, second, and third dynasty, as the dynasty of Setra was considered to be the absolute first, the Zeroeth dynasty. Comparable to how we here in the uh, Christian West reset our calendar to year zero to match the uh, birth of Jesus Christ. And even after Setra's death, the various kingdoms of Khemri remained unified into a single empire. And it was quite prosperous for a considerable while. Several dynasties, from three to be precise. Well, three dynasties is technically correct, but not entirely so, as during the course of the third dynasty, everything went straight down the shitter with such a force that it took the ring, the porcelain, and everything with it straight down the drainage pipes with the ascension of Nagash, a rather famous figure in Warhammer lore. Sources differ on whether Nagash was the firstborn or the secondborn son of King Kithep of Khemri, but what we can tell for more or less certain is that Nagash rose to the head of the then extremely powerful and influential mortuary cult, rising to the position of High Priest. And like all mortuary priests, Nagash was searching for a cure to death 
an elixir of immortality. And while extremely potent in the realms of magic, he, like all of his predecessors, could not find a way to cure death. That is, until a group of Dark Elf captives was brought to Camry, and from one of the captives, a sorcerer, Nagash learned the dark arts of necromancy, amongst many other vile secrets. And he was, history tells us, the first human to begin utilizing the winds of magic, or the raw power of chaos, if you will, in any meaningful way, and began to summon both the demons and the undead. And some say he was even the first person to figure out how to refine the power of the warp into warp stone, although I'll take that with a grain of salt, as we all know that the Skavens were the first one to do that. Insolent bastard human. Anyways, Nagash decided that he was not at all happy with the limited power of being the High Priest of the Mortuary Cult, and decided that he would much rather become High King of Kemri, a position that was uh, reserved for his brother Thutep. Now, this is where a bit of the controversy comes in, as some sources claim that Nagash was the second son, and that was why he entered the mortuary cult, or the priesthood essentially, while his elder brother was groomed for rulership. And some other sources claimed that his father simply didn't like the look of Nagash, and decided to ship him off to the temple, while again grooming his brother for leadership. Either way, Nagash took a rather dim view of these plans, and after the death of his father, he slew his brother and entombed him into his father's own pyramid. And speaking of entombment, once Nagash had learned everything he could from the Dark Elf Sorcerer, he executed the sorcerer's fellow prisoners' companions, blinded the sorcerer, removed her tongues and hands, and buried her alive within the same pyramid that he buried his father and his older brother. So, at least he was consistent. And since there was no one stupid enough to raise their hands and go, ah, wait a minute, what happened to your brother? Nagash became the undisputed ruler of the Kingdom of Khemri, and began the construction of his perhaps greatest work of magic, and, unbeknownst, to his then allies, the other kings of Kemri, perhaps the key to his own immortality. He began the construction of the Great Black Pyramid of Kemri, a massive pyramid that dwarfed every other pyramid built to that day. And there had been a lot of pyramids built up until then, as, just with the Egyptians, every single king of Khemri wanted a grand tomb for him to rest in once he was dead. The Great Black Pyramid took 50 years to complete, and was made entirely out of a dark stone the colour of ebony that seemed to swallow the very light around it. And the taxes imposed upon the vassal kingdoms of Khemri to build this massive edifice led to famine and the general destruction of the once so prosperous kingdom to the point where all the other city-states engaged in open rebellion against Khemri, and they raised a massive army to take care of business. Nagash, however, having not a whole lot of loyal human servants left after his reign of terror, most of them having defected or, well, having just been killed because Nagash was in a bit of a hissy fit that particular day, used his black arts of necromancy to raise an army of the undead. And you can imagine the shock of the other kingdoms as the undead were at this point a completely unheard of phenomenon. Not to mention that in Khemri, the dead were sacred, and here this crazy bastard was raising an entire army of the sacred dead. And while the sheer terror of such an act forced hundreds amongst the armies of the kingdoms of Khemri to flee, it was also seen as the absolute biggest possible insult that Nagash could ever have leveled against their way of life, their religion, and their very existence. 
and the rage against this incredible desecration became the very thing that brought Nagash down as his army was destroyed around him by enraged Cameriants. But while Nagash's army was destroyed and he was driven out of Kemri, he was not slain, which was to be something that the kings of Kemri would regret dearly. And while the victorious kings of Kemri did what they could to wipe out the legacy of Nagash, killing all his servants that they could get their hands on, and burning his uh, prized nine books of Nagash, the uh, Liber Mortis, his treaties on necromancy, so to say. However, quite a few of the books were smuggled out before they could all be destroyed, which was a mistake that the kings of Camry would also come to rule greatly. And as for the Black Pyramid itself, well, efforts were made to destroy it, but imagine, if you will, a nation like Camry, in which the dead were considered sacred, and in most cases more valuable than humans, you've got this massive black pyramid, bigger than anything you have ever before seen, built by a batshit insane sorcerer who raised armies of the dead, and had been said to wield the very powers of dark gods in the form of his magic. You wouldn't be too damn motivated to take a pickaxe to that thing now, would you? And so the Black Pyramid was simply left abandoned. And this was perhaps to be the greatest mistake of all, as 1111 years after his first death, Nagash was reincarnated within that very Black Pyramid. But that is many, many years into the future. For the moment, we'll stick with the time that Nagash was still alive. Having fled to the northeast, Nagash created a new kingdom of the undead, and in the mountains of the so-called Cripple Peak, he built his fortress of Nagashizar. Upon a great secret deposit of warpstone, and over the years, he came to learn how to manipulate the Warpstone, how to use it to fuel his spells and enhance his soldiers. Not to mention the forging of mighty weapons with Warpstone as their base. And remember, Warpstone is the very power of chaos distilled, and as such, you can imagine the sheer ridiculousness of a weapon forged from it. And while most humans would simply have been torn apart by the rampant mutations caused by such close proximity to the very manifest form of chaos being Warpstone, Nagash was at this point no longer human. He had become a lich, a walking, living, thinking skeleton, essentially. And instead of driving him insane, or insane-er, really, and crippling his body, the Warpstone only made him stronger, as by this point he was practically a creature of magic. However, the Warpstone also drew the attention of another race of beings, the ever lovable and fluffy Skaven, who fought a massive war against the forces of Nagash underneath Crippled Peak, in which both sides essentially ground each other to a stalemate. The Skaven had essentially infinite manpower, or rat power, to throw at the undead, and Nagash in return had nearly infinite undead manpower, simply resurrecting the Skavens and uh, anyone who was foolish enough to live in the nearby area. And all attempts by the Skaven to overcome his forces by magic was blunted by the sheer destructive power of Nagash's magic, having been the very first human to learn magic, the relatively powerful grey seers of the Skaven race were like children to him. However, after years of this fruitless, grinding war taking up much of his strength, Nagash offered the Skaven a truce. He would give them Warpstone in payment for services. For example, he would pay them to bring Orc tribes into the pits beneath his fortress, he would pay them to kidnap humans, he would pay them to assassinate people he, well, wanted assassinated. 
And while the Skavens were, uh, shall we say, slightly skeptical as to Nagasha's plans, they really, really wanted that warp stone. And they essentially just decided that, well, it's probably better to just take the warp stone now, and we can surely just deal with whatever Nagash has got planned anyway, so let's swindle the old fool for whatever warp stone he can give us. This would, of course, turn out to be a slight miscalculation on the part of the Skaven, a very rare miscalculation, I promise you, squeak. <laughs> Anyways. With the aid of the Skaven, the Nagash trapped several tribes of orcs, killed them and turned them into undead servants, further growing his already considerable undead army. And not only did his army grow, but he received help from a rather unexpected source. The Queen of the Cambrian Kingdom of Lachemia had discovered one of his books of necromancy and had become captivated by the dark lore contained within and had become quite an apt student of necromancy. And as so many of the kings and queens of Camry before her, the Queen of Lachemia, Neferata, made a pact with Nagash. She would become his loyal servant and his ally in return for a elixir of eternal life. And while it certainly was an elixir of eternal something, it wasn't quite life. As the elixir she was given was the elixir of the damned. That as soon as she drank from the elixir she was killed immediately and resurrected just as immediately as the very first vampire to blight the Warhammer world. However, having turned into a vampire and now frequently feasting on her servants and all manners of innocent people, that kind of blood-soaked debauchery cannot go unnoticed for too long, and the other kings of Camry decided that, well, we've seen what happened last time we let someone play around with necromantic powers in our country, so best squash this particular bud before it grows into a fully-fledged undead tree and mustered a massive army to wage war upon uh, the Queendom of Lamia. And in a rather short and brutally one-sided war, the Kingdom of Lachemia was crushed, and the Queen, along with a retinue of uh, six of them remaining vampires, fled to Crippled Peak, and the tender embrace of her good friend Nagash. Nagash himself warmly accepted the vampires, seeing them as a spawn of his own corrupting magic, and assumed that they would be pretty much just bigger, badder, undead, and figured he could make use of their loyalty and their power as he unleashed yet again war upon the lands of Khemri. However, Nagash had severely underestimated his former countryman, Alkadizar the Conqueror, was, um, some say, the greatest king that Khemri had ever seen. Perhaps even greater than Setra. And his unified armies of Khemri crushed the invading undead and forced Nagash and his remaining vampire servants to flee once again back into Nagashashir and Crippled Peak. And seeing this particular ship flooding with water damn quickly, his ever-so-loyal vampire servants decided that enough was enough and it was about time for these particular rats to leave the ship, leaving only a single vampire by the name of Vazoran remaining in Nagash's service. Understandably miffed by this rather tragic lack of trust, Nagash decided that if he could not rule the Nehekara, then no one could, and in the greatest act of I am taking my ball and going home ever, he asked his Skaven allies to pollute the river Vitae, which is essentially the Warhammer world's version of the Nile, whose water the desert people of Khemri relied upon, both to drink and for their crops. And after having been so thoroughly tainted that the river was renamed the River Mortis, 
the Kingdom of Kemri began to crumble, as their primary source of water, and therefore life, was now corrupted beyond all hopes of salvation. And the once great king, al Qadisa, was forced to watch as his beloved empire crumbled around him, and a new army of the undead began their invasion of the lands of Kemri. And this time there was no great army of Kemri to stop them, as the handful of desperate defenders were easily swept away by the hosts of Nagash. And rather than simply kill the king al Qadisa, Nagash decided to imprison him so that he could indulge in some of his more sadistic tendencies. And also, he intended to use him as a sacrifice for his greatest spell so far. The spell he cast caused not only everything within hundreds of miles to wither and die and then rise again as the undead, but it affected the Warhammer world on a fundamental plane, causing apocalyptic earthquakes and volcano eruptions to rock the World Edge Mountains. And this was then also to be the final end of the Dwarven Age of Gold. And would probably have been the end of the Dwarves, the Elves and the Humans and everybody else had he been allowed to finish properly. Because while the first part of his spell was simply that to kill and raise again all of the undead in the entirety of Nehekara, all the entombed kings in their tombs, all of the dead upon the battlefield, all of the dead in every single graveyard, in every single temple in Kemri, and the lands around it, the second part was to bind all of these undead to Nagash's undying will. However, Nagash was thwarted by a most unexpected of heroes. The Skaven Council of Thirteen had watched proceedings from a safe distance and could not avoid to notice the sheer magnitude of the spell that Nagash had unleashed. And so, eager to finally take full control of the Warpstone underneath Cripple Peak, and painfully aware that the very first living creatures to bear the brunt of Nagash's recently raised undead army were to be themselves, the Skaven decided that Nagash had to go. But, well, they couldn't find a single Skaven brave enough, or in Skaven terms, stupid enough, to try and assassinate Nagash. The last Skaven that had tried had been turned inside out by a mere flick of his little finger. And so, in proper Skaven terms, they decided to lump the job up off to someone else. And it just so happened that Nagash himself had provided the perfect candidate, having captured and not killed the former Cambrian king, al Qadisa. And so, realizing that it would require quite the weapon to make sure that Nagash got put down and stayed down, the Council of Thirteen forged their most powerful weapon ever created, the mighty two-handed sword Fellblade, with a blade created from pure refined warpstone. And enchanted with foul skaven runes of incredible potency, the weapon was so lethal that even to just carry it was an automatic death sentence. And so the transportation of the weapon from Skaven Blight to the Crippled Peak was uh, an exercise in Skaven slavemanship. But finally, the blade was brought into the dungeons beneath Crippled Peak. Nagash himself was exhausted from his spell and just simply did not notice the Skaven sneaking into his dungeons. Although it took the lives of several Skaven Greyseer mages to make sure that he didn't notice. And once inside, they gave the sword Fellblade to the King al Qadisa and unlocked his cell and punted him on his way. al Qadisa himself, understandably enough, did not require much encouragement to go and wreak his just vengeance upon Nagash, and Nagash, weakened as he was from the massive spell he had just cast, 
couldn't put up much of a fight as the king he considered vanquished showed up within his study wielding a blade of such ridiculous power that he was capable of nullifying even Nagash's magic in his weakened state. And at that point, the fight essentially boils down to one very angry Egyptian armed with a ridiculously dangerous two-handed weapon against one emancipated, half-naked, and unarmed old man. So, that was a rather one-sided contest right there. After al Karisa was done chopping Nagash into tiny, 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 tiny pieces, and then finished chopping off the tiny, 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 tiny pieces into even tinier pieces, he succumbed to the power of Fellblade and fell over stone dead. Just in time for the Skaven to swoop in, claim credit by carrying off Nagash's corpse, and throw him into the Warpstone Forges, destroying whatever was left of the tiny little squirming atoms. And so the Skavens had found themselves a brand new holding in Crippled Peak and more Warpstone than they damn well knew what to do with. And as for the undead that Nagash had risen from their slumber in Kemri, well, they suddenly found themselves without a master. And this brings us to the more or less present day state of the Tomb Kings of Kemri. As the Tomb Kings had been embalmed before their death to a considerably higher degree than the average raised corpse, the king now finding themselves without the uh, overruling influence of Nagash, found that they could think for themselves, even though they were long dead. And while they felt slightly cheated by this world they had been raised into, having not been quite the earthly paradise that the priests had promised them, they decided that, well, might as well start improving the place and started to wage a war upon everyone else. And, well, remember, the kingdoms of Kemri have had hundreds, if not thousands, of kings at this point, and now, after Nagash's spell, every single bloody one of them arose from his grave and started to command his undead warriors who had also risen with him once again. And so, a brief but incredibly violent civil war ripped through the Kemrian kingdoms as every single damn king from the ages rose up and decided that he would be the one to conquer everything this time around, until finally, the last to awake was the great High King Setra himself, who, with his vastly numerically superior armies, having been buried with entire armies of troops, quickly subjugated the various kings and ordered them to go back to their slumber, and only to rise again in the defense of their territory, until Setra could figure out, well, essentially, what the hell to do. One thing, though, he was completely clear on. The kingdoms of Kemri had to be defended from outside threats of from Araby, from the orcs, from goblins, from all manners of various creatures that had decided that the now empty ruins would be a wonderful place to set up camp. And so, he raised back to life many of the priests that had been entombed alongside their lords and created a new mortuary cult. These priests were to become known as the Lich Priests, and they are responsible for maintaining the undead armies of the various kings and rousing them to war whenever it is necessary to defend their territories against invaders. Now, grant you, this is a task that Setra himself will usually carry out, but dear old Setra can't be everywhere at once, and so he has to delegate some of his defensive work to the kings. And as long as the vast majority of kings are asleep, no single or even dozens of tomb kings are going to have any ideas of challenging Setra as even when they were all awake, they still couldn't beat him, and so they can be considered quite loyal, as far as loyalty goes, anyways, amongst the undead. And so we have a really, really strange situation, where the undead are not really dead. The kings and the priests and the princes 
retain their former memories, they retain their personalities and, to a certain extent, their humanity, while the vast majority of the undead, skeletons, etc., are not alive, they recall only the most rudimentary elements of their previous lives, and while they are better at fighting than your average undead skeleton found in other places, they cannot be said to be sentient, they are little more than automatons carrying out the orders of their kings and princes. However, even then, the lands of the Tomb Kings are not entirely devoid of life. For example, there is the city of Numars, a rather interesting little city where the living live in the city protected by the Tomb Kings. They pay homage to the local Tomb King, and they pay him essentially taxes, and in return they abide by his laws and he protects them. And while for the moment this is but one city, it is not entirely inconceivable that the Tomb Kings that retain much of their humanity might at some point in the future be able to live alongside the humans of the land. And since they have no need for blood, like for example the vampire counts who have found a way to live alongside the uh, humans of the world, it should be a relatively easy task for the Tomb Kings to reintegrate themselves into what is essentially a living society. However, of course, Kemri is nothing like the powerhouse it used to be. The years of disrepair and neglect have laid many of the once grand cities to dust, and the once mighty armies of the Tomb Kings are now much reduced, and continuously being reduced even further by various incursions by the other races. And for the moment they exist in a bit of a stasis-like state. Cetera has not yet fully decided on a course, on one hand, he has ordered many of his Tomb Kings to slay the all living that enter his land. On the other hand, he tolerates the presence of a city that mixes both humans and undead. And on yet another hand, he has on several occasions expressed a will to sweep out of Kemri and take over other parts of the world. But then again, he has also expressed that he would rather just be left alone to rule his kingdoms as he once did. As such, Camry is a very, very strange nation indeed, as, well, it doesn't have much of an economy because of the cause the dead don't really need to buy or sell anything, nor do they need food, nor water, and of course they don't really build any structures. They need no place to shelter, they need no barracks to train new troops, and they have no official bureaucracy. The closest they come are probably the lich priests of the mortuary cult, who have been tasked by Cetra not only to maintain the vigil of the Tomb Kings, but also to try and take care of many of the crumbling monuments and cities scattered across the deserts of Khemri. So in a total war game, they could potentially be an incredibly interesting faction. Just think about this, you start out with a relatively small power base, yes? You start out with your purely undead population, and you've got to make a choice. Do you try to subjugate the entire world to the rule of death? In which case, you would probably have to build an undead horde. You wouldn't have any upkeep or anything like that, you wouldn't have to feed your troops, you would have essentially no economy. But, you would have one resource, more important than gold, wood, timber or anything else, namely your soldiers, because Nehekaran soldiers are not something you can simply just raise out of the desert, they were emboldened warriors of a previous decade. The only way you are going to get more soldiers is if you raid the tombs of all the tomb kings is if you raise and then take the time to equip and integrate new skeletons into your existing units. Essentially creating something of a hive mind, slowly but surely integrating them into your army. Which could be, depending on how they do it, a really interesting mechanic. You have a very finite amount of units and you have to use them wisely to create more units.
Alternatively, something I think might be even more interesting is to say that Cetra has finally decided that he's no longer going to sit on the sideline. He is going to rebuild the Cambry to its former glory, and he's going to include the living in his grand designs. He is going to make Numas a model city for all the other holdings of the Tomb Kings. He will create an empire of the living and the dead, not to the ghouls and aberrations of the undead vampire counts, but a true mixed nation, where sentient tomb kings command armies of the dead marching alongside human auxiliary. And then you move forth out of the desert to conquer the rest of the world and subjugate them to the rule of Setra the Unperishable. It could be a really, really interesting faction to play. On the other hand, if they just do it half-assed, if they just, you know, give them normal resources and make them play like any other faction, I'd be quite disappointed, but um, we'll see. They could be interesting material for an expansion. For example, say they head southwards into the Land of the Dead. Maybe they add in some savage orc tribes. Maybe they add in the Beastmen of the Southlands, for example. Many interesting things they could do. And of course, any expansion that include the Bretonians could also potentially include the Tomb Kings, as the two have been pissing on each other for a very long time indeed. With the Bretonians, of course, considering all undead to be a bit of a blasphemous thing, an entire nation of the bloody bastards, well, that's just begging for a good old-fashioned crusade of the lady now, isn't it? It'll be interesting to see what they do, but um, sadly, this lore video will be a little bit shorter than normal, simply because, well, it's a nation that doesn't have, you know... A functioning bureaucracy. I can't talk about really about their religious traditions because there's not much of them documented. We know about the mortuary cult, but everything else is hazy to say the absolute least. They don't have a system of bureaucracy that I could talk about. They don't have a particular system of levying their armies because, you know, they're all buried in the tombs alongside their kingdoms. They simply get woken, so to say, by the lich priests. So instead I focus so instead I decided I'd focus on their origin story and a little bit of speculation as to how they might be implemented in Total War game as a cool race. So while it was a bit shorter than usual, I uh, do hope you enjoyed listening to me rant on about this particular subject. I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and uh, hope to see you soon.